Hi, I'm Femi OK, on a mission to add some stimulating conversation to your weekend. I am confident that this bonus edition of the stream will do exactly that. Stand by for the best discussions that I had with guests after the live show was broadcast. Coming up, Yemi Alade, the luminous Nigerian singer, songwriter, and UNDP Goodwill ambassador performing right here in the stream studio. I'll also bring you news from the tense political situation in Tunisia. But first, let's head to Louisiana, a state that's still reckoning with racism in its criminal justice system. Until 2020, it was possible for a jury in Louisiana to find someone guilty, even if only 10 of the 12 jurors agreed. Non-unanimous jury verdicts are now illegal, but around 1,500 people are still serving time because of them. Here are guests, Jamila Johnson, Nick Crastill, and Jason Williams passionately explaining why their fight for justice for the incarcerated is so difficult. I'll tell you a story about uh, Betty Broaden. Uh, Betty Broaden, because uh, there isn't enough conversation about women uh, in, in the unfairness of our system. She was convicted of second-degree murder and spent nearly 38 years of her life uh, in jail without the opportunity of parole for shooting and killing a man who threatened to kill her with a gun, attacked her, and sexually assaulted her multiple times inside of her own apartment over the course of the night. She got a hold of his gun, and she was able to kill her attacker. Think about that. You, you hear folks from all over the country talk about standing your ground. In this instance, uh, she was convicted by a non-unanimous jury. Uh, we were able to address it, look into all the facts of the case. She should have never been arrested, right? If, if a man was raped in his home uh, and shot his attacker, he'd probably get a key to the city. Uh, but doing this work has allowed us to actually dig deeper, not in just sort of uh, uh, finding some, some easy cookie-cutter approach, but actually building out the entire uh, Civil Rights Division so we could spend time with each of these folks and their lawyers and their advocates to figure out what really occurred. Ms. Broaden wrote a letter to Harry Connick uh, begging him to look at all the evidence in the case. And when she was, when she was freed, she said... Uh, I wondered if anyone was ever going to look. Nick, what sticks in your mind from all of the reporting that you've done, a story that you will never forget, and why? Well, you know, and I think Jamila and Jason, I'm sure, have, have lots of, of stories of individuals who are convicted on, on 10 to 2 verdicts. Um, just earlier this year, I was able to go to the legislature um, and... and watched the hearing that took place um, that would have, would, where they were debating a law that, that, that would have given new trials to these people. And what was um, interesting to me as I observed it is, is uh, uh, Jamila was there, other advocates were there, there were um, a number of people who had been convicted on split jury verdicts um, who were there. And as well as as, as victims um, of crimes, where the person convicted um, had been had been convicted on a non-unanimous verdict, and and all of these people were giving uh, this really heartfelt and emotional testimony about the need to to uh, to give new trials to to these people um, still in prison. There was no testimony at all um, opposing this law. Yet when it came time to vote. Um, it was it was voted down, um, and it, it was voted down along party lines right. um, in a, a seven to five vote, I believe. Um, and all all of the Republican uh, legislators who who voted it uh, down were were white, and the majority of of the Democratic legislators who who voted um, to to move on the, on this law were black. And that, you know that that was striking given given the history of this law and. and and, and, you know, it's not to say that there aren't arguments to be made for why this, this would be a, a difficult thing to, to, to do, but at that hearing, um, they weren't made, and, and it was a—I th I thought it was a—it um, it was 
sort of sort of a, a jarring representation of, of sort of how these things continue to play out and, and the, the optics of all of it. Nick, I, um, I, I hear you trying to find the words where you're not trying to just say they're racist, right? That's that, I, I hear you trying to find appropriate words here. Let me just bring in Nicholas Moscarello. Um, he is a Republican state representative. And he was asked about, well, how do you remedy this situation? Nick, you pointed out the politics at play here. And let's have a look and have a listen to Nicholas. If it was deemed unconstitutional, and we know that it's rooted in a racist origin, and there's, there's 1,500 people there that are sitting there, they sleep there at night, and a lot of them are in there for life. Don't they deserve their case to be looked at again? I feel pretty confident in my vote because the Supreme Court said that the way we did it was correct. How is it not unconstitutional for the people there who are there now? The Supreme Court said we were fine, so I can't argue with the Well, Supreme what do you Court. think? I think what we did was bold, monumental, and I'm happy that we got that push forward. Do you think that those people deserve a remedy? I think there is a remedy. What is the remedy? The remedy is the DA can review it. But if the DA decides not to review, then they then don't... Then they don't have a remedy. I feel so callous, right? It's a shrug, Jamila. Yeah. I mean, every time I watch that clip, I want to say to the representative, no, the U.S. Supreme Court found it unconstitutional for everyone. The only thing that they didn't do was give the remedy, and they're, they're counting on us as the state of Louisiana to do that. Um, every time I watch that, I, I just can't fathom how the state legislators could have sat through more than two hours of testimony on two days from so many people impacted by this issue and not even know what the U.S. Supreme Court did. I am Jason. I'm still seeing some comments on YouTube. I love this one from Peter Piper. Peter says, you don't need money to open cell blocks and let people free. It's absolutely right. Um, it's unfair. It's racist. It's unconstitutional. Those, those, are, those are all the things we need to know about it. So there is no option not to act. But the one thing I'll say about that legislator that was, that was just on the screen that is very consistent. Uh, the states that have legalized cannabis, they haven't gone back to deal with the folks that were convicted of cannabis. That is a very consistent theme uh, in America, this idea that we correct the law, but we don't do anything about uh, those persons uh, and families who were harmed by the unfair law, right? So uh, it, it's easy just to do a thing, right? It, 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 but but you, you, if you want to have impact in people's lives, you have to do the rest of the hard work, which is addressing it, reckoning with it. And one of the things that I'm surprised he didn't say, he didn't bring up victims and survivors. Victims and survivors were also part of that large mass of people that voted overwhelmingly to change this law in 2018. And when I have conversations with them, they didn't realize that that, that verdict was not unanimous and they understand why we are reckoning with it. Uh, and so if the, if, the, if the persons who were directly harmed in some of those situations understand why we must reckon with this and confront the sins of the past, then their paid, they're, they're, they're elected representatives uh, in the state house need mm. to also see that same thing. To find out more about non-unanimous juries, check out the new Fault Lines documentary, The Jim Crow Convictions. It's now streaming on the Fault Lines page at aljazeera.com. Back in July, Tunisia's parliament was dissolved. President Kai Saeed is currently ruling by decree. Independent journalist Sam Kimball works in Tunisia. He took me behind the headlines to explain how people in Tunisia are living through these tense political times. I was just a few blocks down the street in my neighborhood. It's a largely working class neighborhood, um, a little bit outside the center of Tunis. Um, I was asking the, uh, the fruit seller at his tiny little fruit stand uh, what he thought about the nomination of the, this newest uh, prime minister. Um, and all he did is just raise his thumbs up and say, good, 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 really good. Um, when I started to ask him a few further questions, um, there was a, a customer behind me who was selecting um, 
you know, fruits to buy. And he, um, he couldn't help himself. He kept kind of jumping in with questions until finally he came over and stood in front of me with, with the fruit seller, um, talking about how, yeah, he agreed with the, the president's uh, decision since July 25th. Um, that he had confidence in this new uh, prime minister who he has nominated, um, and um, and that you know even though she's an uh, kind of unknown in politics, that yeah. she would do good things for the country. But um, when I asked him about um, accountability for those who are seen as corrupt and uh, mishandling the the country and especially its wealth, um, he said, "Ah, oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, because." Uh, the, the, the president, Kai Saeed, had said, had taken these measures saying that he wanted to combat corruption and that he was going to hold the corrupt who were stealing the country's wealth accountable. And he said, yeah, well, there hasn't really been any, any accountability. Uh, I said, well, what will you do if there's not in six months or a year or, or two years? He said, well, you know, we're, we're smart. We're, we're smart people. We'll, we'll go out into the street or the military will take over. Um, and in the current circumstances, there's so much desperation that there is a chunk of the population that sees the military guiding the country, at least in some areas, uh, as a better alternative to the kind of political chaos and the economic decline uh, that most ordinary Tunisians have just experienced uh, over a lot of the last 10 years. Sam, I've just brought up a headline. This is from earlier on uh, this month or a little bit before that. Uh, I'm going to show it to you here on, on my laptop. It's about Tunisia's first female PM. What would be your Sam unfiltered take on the PM? What do we need to know? What can you tell us? Uh, my Sam unfiltered take is uh, kind of what I gather from conversations on the street, on the phone, on social media. Um, it, I, I, I think that there's a strong possibility that uh, the president, Kai Saeed, has nominated uh, this woman, Nejla Boudin uh, Ramzan, um, a university professor with little to no formal political experience, um, uh, has, has put her in this position, which is largely powerless in the, in the, with the current state of things. Um, as a way to signal uh, to the international community that he's a, a defender of women's rights and that he may be more progressive than he actually is. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, some might say that that's kind of a cynical view, um, but I've heard you know numerous more critically minded folks uh, say that. Even folks who are kind of a little bit supportive of the president's actions have said, yeah, well, you know, I don't know this lady, um, especially women I've spoken to have said, yeah, I don't, I don't know her. I don't, I don't know what she can do. She hasn't proved her, her, uh, her ability to kind of deliver on the, the promises of the revolution or the promises of the president, namely employment, better economic situation, better management of the COVID pandemic, um, the things that affect everyday ordinary Tunisians, you know, in their majority. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my kind of off-the-cuff reaction when I see that headline. All right, so I'm going to say the last question is Sam maybe mildly filtered, uh, and you'll see why. I'm actually going to share something that you retweeted, which was about several journalists had to go for cover. Um, uh, they were protesting outside of Parliament in the Bardo neighbourhood of Tunis, and they were sorted by police. So you are operating as a journalist. So I do understand that there are difficulties that you have in being totally unfiltered about being able to tell the story of Tunisia. What can you tell us about telling the story of Tunisia? Yeah, uh, I think telling the story of Tunisia after July 25th has become measurably harder for, for journalists, uh, people who just do public uh, communications um, and research and reporting. It's become uh, harder, harder for, for a lot of colleagues, uh, or, or at least some colleagues that I know, um, who have either faced uh, police harassment, um, violence, um, and, uh, or kind of stonewalling. I myself lost just two days after July 25th, after those extraordinary measures were taken by the president. I lost my wallet, and in it was my, uh, my Tunisian press card. Um, so all of the reporting that I did on camera, 
um, in, the, in the following weeks was within the walls of the Tunisian journalists, uh, the National Tunisian Journalist Syndicate, because that was the only safe place that we thought we could do the work without being harassed or just outright stopped by the police who were kind of waiting on guard outside. Thank you, Sam, for bringing your reporting to the stream. And now, as previously advertised, the behind-the-scenes conversation I had with one of Africa's biggest singer-songwriters. Please welcome performing Shekre, the queen of Afrobeats, the darling of social media, UNDP Goodwill Ambassador Yemi Alade. I've been touring for about four or five years, mm -hmm. and I notice every time that my audiences seem to be a bit different from my counterparts. It has a mix of many kinds of races, different tribes coming yeah. together. And, and, and I'm happy because music, when it comes to music, there is no one language, because music itself, it's a language. I love this. I'm just going to show this on my laptop because this made me laugh. It's one of my favorite videos. So okay. it's from, from your Twitter account. It says, in the middle of nowhere, Ooh. North Adams. Oh, yes. OK. Yes. There's a backstory to that. But this, I'm just going to show one more picture. People staring at you, but not just staring at you. They are singing along. And they are now, I can tell, Yemi Alade fans, what is going on here? This is a mixture of cultures. Yes. Countries, yes. what in your music is reaching out to people? You know, when I first arrived at the festival, because actually a festival in North Adams, Massachusetts, I was like, Am I at the wrong festival? I said, No, we actually booked you for this show. We love to hear your music. We think that, that, that everyone out here should get a piece of Yemi Aladi. I'm like, That is all I needed to hear. And so I decided I was going to take them on a journey. And the response was beautiful. And like I said, when it comes to music, there is no language. Music itself, you feel it. It takes control. Look, I tell you, when I looked into the audience, the oldest ladies, the ones that looked like maybe they were 60, they danced the most. <laughs> they were just going at their own pace. And look, if you had walked past one of them ladies without looking well, she probably would have given you a punch and gone on with her dance. It was some Jackie Shan. Everybody was really, the energy. I, to be sincere, in a long time, I haven't felt that much energy in forever. It was so beautiful. I loved it. What is it like when you're staying on stage and the audience is singing back to you? I... It always hits home for me when I see the audience singing my songs back to me. It means that they have, they have literally digested the music, they understand it, it's part of them, it's now their song. And I'm just happy to share that moment with them because that's why I'm out here, to actually share the moment 
with my people. Yeah. I uh, notice on social that there are a number of really well-known Nigerian artists touring the US right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like a reunion. Exactly. <laughs> All going, uh, what, is it a coincidence? Is it something about Nigerian music? What, what is going on? Is it a takeover? You know, I, I, I wish there were, there were just one way, there was just one way to answer that question. Mm. But I think that if you check even the previous years, there's been every time that I'm touring, a lot of other artists are also touring. But this time around, I think it's a bit more special because it's mostly the Nigerian acts that are out there. And you know, the rest of the world hasn't exactly picked up on tours. Um, so maybe we are really just enjoying the spotlight. <laughs> Take over time. I, have I like to... this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very Nigerian thing to do. Yeah. I have to ask this about uh, COVID and touring because I was shocked when I saw that you were going to be touring the US. Mm -hmm. It took a while for you to come into the oh, country to get your visa. Sis. What is what is that like? Because other artists are probably looking at you going, how did Yemi Aladdi get to tour? How, how is she doing that in COVID? <sighs> So first of all, in 2020, I got three tours canceled, obviously because of COVID. My American tour, my European tour, and for the first time, I was going to tour Asia. That really broke my heart because I've been looking forward to that. Um, and so when the opportunity came to tour America, I almost didn't want to go. But then I, I felt an awakening, and once that happened, there was no stopping me. So I did the necessary um, applications, my agent um, filed the necessary documents. I even, because I was in London for Yam Festival, and I def if you're in London, you need to stay another 14 days before you come into the States. Um, I was privileged to get a special kind of visa that allows me to go into any part of, to, to come into America from whatever country, especially because I'm touring and these events can't go on without me. Yeah. I'm obviously here on a work visa. Yeah. Um, and obviously that also helps to better the American government and the American um, economy and also better my, you know, my status and reach out to my people for yeah. There's one story I'd like you to tell just to end with, and it's a story from your dad who's no longer with us. But it's a story about him counting out beans. There were big beans and little you beans. You know too much, Femi. I know just enough, you Mr. Know too much. Tell us the bean story, because I think it's a perfect story to end on. Oh, my sweet daddy. I miss him every now and then. Um, my mom's birthday was a few days ago, and I got her a little gift. I, I really wish that I had gotten two cars, because I really wish my dad was there. It should have been two cars, not one. Oh. I miss him, and there's nothing, nothing can replace my dad in my life ever. I will forever, I can't wait to see him. I'll wait, anyways, because I need to do some things on Earth. <laughs> but, um, whew, the story about beans. So I don't know what touched my daddy on this particular day, but he called me into the living room and my younger brother, who was very distracted, I don't think he remembers the story. And he says, Yemi, come here, come here. Bring a cup of beans with you from the kitchen. I say, Daddy, for what we've cooked, bring it. And then I bring it, I'm all grumpy, I'm like, what does this man want now? I give it to Daddy, and then he says, just watch me. He puts the book aside, because he's always reading. He puts his book aside, takes a cup of beans, and he shakes it, shakes it, shakes it. He said, wait, look at, look at, look into the, look into this cup, what do you see? I said, that is beans now, the person that brought it for you. I say, hold up, look at it now, describe what you see. I say, I tell him, daddy, I see some small beans, I see some big beans, they're, they're different in size. And then he shakes a little more vigorously. And he says, now what do you see? I say, oh, there's only small beans on top now. He says, exactly. That is how life is. It doesn't matter if you come from a privileged background, if you are big or small, you're rich or poor, as long as you put in that vigorous work, you put in every element of yourself into that work, you will come up, you will come out on top. And I think that is what I have applied in my entire career, even my life as a person. When I involve myself in anything, I give my all. And, and I'm thankful to my dad for, you know, being the perfect example, even until his last day. He was a very selfless man, very determined, very d disciplined, and he definitely groomed me into the woman that I am today. Oh my goodness, what a story. Thank you, Yemi's dad, for producing such a fabulous daughter. Or as we say in Yoruba, Osheo. And that is our show for today. I will leave you with Yemi Alade playing us out. Thanks for watching. Nowhere be like Africa. Nowhere be the home. Anywhere, anywhere you go, you go. You're for she can go. Nowhere be like Africa. Nowhere.
feel like Washington, D.C.